Welcome everyone. The topic of this uh, discussion is how to get your game published, I think. How to get your game to market. How to get your game to market. Um, I'm James Ernest, uh, formerly of Cheap Ass Games. I now have an enterprise called Crab Fragment Games where I make games I can't sell, uh, uh, <laughs> which sounds good. No, it sounds great. It does. Now, um, in the early days of Cheap Ass Games, I definitely had an eye towards selling the games, but I knew that I was self-publishing, and so I could make whatever silly crap I wanted and sort of market it under the notion that if it was terrible, it's okay because you only paid four or five dollars for it. And, and it was all about times at bat. Let me make this funny game and see if you like it, and if you do, great, and if you don't, try the next one because they're only four or five bucks. So um, that's how I got started, and then Cheap Ass went through some phases. Uh, including a Kickstarter phase where we started doing much more sophisticated products in terms of their production values because that's how Kickstarter works. Uh, when, and, and so that was still self-publishing but at a sort of different scale. Um, and now I'm back to my roots. I'm making games for my own entertainment. I'm putting them up online. They're only print and play. Uh, a few of the card games are also print on demand but none of them is going through retail. None of them is going through traditional channels, they're just, if you want this, you should print it and play it, and that's the end of the story. Uh, it keeps me from having to have staff and inventory and printing and shipping and all the things that I hate and just making up games uh, and putting them online. So when I talk about bringing games to market, I usually try to convince people to think about market in a much more broad sense. Like we go to the game store and we see the kind of games that wind up in the game store and that's great and there's a lot of competition there and you don't want to run your own business or else you wouldn't even be here. You want to make games and sell them. So selling it to a publisher who deals with all that is definitely a right way to go. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum is making games for your own enjoyment, making games for your friends to play, making games for a smaller ever-growing circle of, of fans to play and giving them away or, or selling them in a way. I don't just give them away. I tell people, back my Patreon, you know, buy my products on uh, drive through buy my t-shirts if you like, whatever. Like, there's ways people can give me money. Um, I just had someone scrambling to give me PayPal because he liked one of my games and wanted to pay me for it. I'm like, great, that's good. Well, here's how you do that. But it's not about the dinosaurs that are still with us printing and publishing and distribution and all of the parts of that machine that that I think you're familiar with if you're only buying games in game stores. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So so yes, I will be the advocate for, for God's sake, make a few games and give them away and figure out if they're any good before you worry too much about how to put them on Kickstarter. The other end of the coin is, uh, as we were talking about earlier, Kickstarter kind of lets you make a product and sell it without anyone ever knowing if it's any good. So there's plenty of games that look great but aren't actually all that fun coming out of that process because that's how that process works. Um, so I've run plenty of Kickstarter campaigns. I've published myself. I've sold games to other publishers over my career. I've even sold a casino game. That is a nightmare uh, from which I am not yet awoke. But uh, I can talk about all of those from my perspective and give you sort of the answers from the panelists who aren't here as well as my own. Uh, so where, uh, where shall we start? What, are, what, are, what, what do we want to do? I'd like to hear about Kickstarter. I've uh, pitched one game idea to um, some companies um, and they said, hey, good game, but doesn't quite fit. You know, yeah, they're thinking, yeah. you know. So uh, I still think the game is a good idea, not mass market enough to appeal to the, at least the company that I pitched it to, but you know I've got very zero social media following right. and stuff, so right. I'm afraid if I put it on Kickstarter, it'll just sit, you know, get number one thousand out of. Yep. Yeah. yeah uh, so the reason that the way crowdfunding works is you have to have the crowd before you have the funding. That's why they put it in that order. Uh, so you're right, you, you, without a, a, a network of players already, an installed network and an anticipation of your product, mm -hmm. you can put a game on Kickstarter, but no one's going to come to it, right? That's, that market is filling up quickly. There's a lot of competition there, just like everywhere else. I was literally on a Kickstarter panel with the people who run Kickstarter at uh, a PAX Dev like four years ago, and someone in the audience was like, 
I've noticed that Kickstarter seems to be most useful to people who already are famous. What are you doing about that? And I was like, hold on, can I just restate the question? You're just complaining that Kickstarter works like everything else. <laughs> right? So what I tell people on Kickstarter is, if you're trying to get a new product like attention, the magic word is with. Find someone else who can help promote your product, who really cares about your product. Not just yeah. an email to a random stranger, but right. get someone, put their picture in the game, make the game about their world, do whatever you can mm -hmm. with someone who's got a big audience, collaborate with them, and they will bring their people to your door. My biggest success story that way is TAC, which is mm -hmm. an abstract game from a book. Now, I did not typically make abstract games because I knew I couldn't sell them. Yeah. But here's a game that's based on a, a game in a very popular book with a very dedicated audience of a very specific and particular author uh -huh. who when he tells his people this exists, yeah. they will all come to my door, right. right? And they will buy that game, whether it's good or not. Yeah. Whether TAC was good or not, it was gonna raise a bunch of money on Kickstarter. And that's, that's how the sort of cult of personality, IP-driven products do on that platform. So yes, if you wanna get a Kickstarter, either have a publisher who has a, a fan base who will buy what yeah. the publisher makes despite whatever it's about yeah. or integrate into your product mm -hmm. a person with a bigger reach than you have and get them to bring their their mm -hmm. kids to the yard because that's that's the, sure. that the crowd before the funding yeah okay had any experience with again like that I, I worked through uh, uh, the toy coach I don't know if you know her but uh, she teaches an online class to teach people how to develop toys and games has experience in the shoes for for Toys R Us or Crash. Um, so she actually set up a pitch event and I pitched it there. But this was, um, you know, I think actually someone from Hasbro and Mattel were there. So again, they're looking for stuff that's going to sell at Target. Yeah, they and have a very particular like, perspective. Right. So I'm trying to figure out, okay, I need to find a, a game developer who's going to sell games more, like mine's very medieval fantasy. Yeah. Game. So how do I find a game developer who's already... So in, in terms of looking for a publisher for your product, um, it's tough because you want to find a publisher who, first of all, who you respect. Like, yeah. let's start at the top and, and find the publishers who are doing good work. Yeah. You want to... Their product line needs to include a lot of things like yours, mm -hmm. but not too like yours. Yes. Um, oh my God, I just... A couple yeah, years ago, I did a game. <laughs> I'm going to try to color out all the lines here, and I'm going to say Publisher A mm -hmm. came to me and they said, Publisher B has a really successful game. We want you to make us a game that's that good. And what they meant was a game that's for that exact audience, you know, this mm -hmm. and that. And, and so I'd be, okay, I'll make a game like Game B, um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll sell to you guys, and we'll all be happy, right? That was, that's always how the plan starts. Yeah. So I worked on this thing, and, and you know, B grade games, I'm sorry, it doesn't mean it was a bad game, it was just yeah. for company B. Um, they're not my specialty, I'm not too good, I don't know, working on it for years, I, I, I turned it in and they were like, you know what, we don't think we have the budget slash staff slash time slash space in our catalog for this. I'm sorry, it's not gonna work out. Why don't you try pitching it to company B? <laughs> 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 and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So, all right, they set up the meeting, I did the pitch, yeah. and Company B was very nice. They came back within a week and were like, yeah, this game is okay, but we kind of already have a game like this. And I was like, yes, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that's a, that's a tragedy, but, but that's, the, that's the, the path you have to walk, the, the, the knife's edge of, I understand that you have a whole bunch of games that are in this sort of general category, mm -hmm. but you're missing this, this would be a great addition to your product line. You're kind of having to do their marketing work for them, in right. a sense, of saying, I think your product line needs well, this. Now, marketing to them. You are. And on the other hand, maybe they're about to launch a whole new line of stuff that's like what you're doing, and they've never done one before. So I would say start with, with publishers that you respect, whether or not they do exactly what sure. you want. Find out what their submission guidelines are. Mm -hmm. um, float around in the industry, meet all the people. It's a small group of people. There's a few uh, conventions where everyone goes. Mm -hmm. And although you don't want to like burden them with your pitch at Gen Con or at Gamma or whatever, unless you have a scheduled appointment with them. Just meet them, find out who they are, find out what their submission guidelines are, what the process is, because everyone is different, and they're all very friendly and happy to tell you, and I would have told you at Cheap Ass Games, you can't give it to me, I already have plenty of games, sure. right? Some people yeah. just aren't looking for new content, and those that are, maybe, uh, there's still a few companies left who don't want you to show it to anyone else unless you show it to them, but that's yeah. kind of old thinking. Like. They should understand that 
you know, everyone can walk by the window until someone actually comes in the store, like, yeah. everyone can look, right? Um, some of them only review games once or twice a year. They have a, they have a big uh, off-site where for a week they play all the new pitches. Mm -hmm. And so you want to get that schedule or you're going to be waiting another six months. And I think also, when you go down the road of trying to pitch your game, don't let them sit on it for too long. The, the worst thing that happens is nothing. And sometimes nothing can last forever. So be clear up front about how quickly you'd like an answer and how long they expect to take to give you one. Mm -hmm. And then when that time is up, treat it like a no. Don't, don't let them string you along forever. Because yeah. we're only all going to be on this life for you know so many breaths. And we can't wait forever for an answer, especially when that answer is still probably no. Yeah. Um, even after you make a sale, you know, there's going to be frustrating periods of, well, we can't get the pieces sourced from China and we can't find a spot in the schedule. And it's going to be like that. The, the, the frustrations of, of, of selling a game to a game publisher are, are infinitely complex. But luckily it isn't very risky. Luckily it is. You can be an author. You can move on and make your next game. Not worry about all the parts that somebody else is better at. This is why... I eventually sold Cheap Ass Games because I didn't want to run that company anymore. The staff that I had did not want to work at that company anymore. Um, specifically, my wife, who was my second in command <laughs> and doing all the hard work, yeah. did not want to do all that for the, for what I was paying her. <laughs> and so, you know, it was time to find a new owner for this, uh, for better or worse. Yeah. And uh, and and at least for my sake, go back to the early days of doing whatever the hell I wanted, whether I could sell it or not. Yeah. <laughs> so. So any more questions about like that process? Like like I kind of touched on everything about selling a game to a publisher, but what did I miss? What's that reasonable period of time that you should give it six weeks? Man, six weeks sounds like solid gold. Six months feels more reasonable, and it's usually like a year or two. I had a game sitting at a publisher for like five years because I didn't know what else to do with it. And they, like they, it was a game that required, a, in a perfect world, it was going to have a lot of varieties, and it was going to have a lot of like advertising that they would have to sell, so that essentially they could make the game for free. Oh. It's essentially a game based on a map of the city, so you get all the restaurants or all the attractions in the city, you know, to pay money to be in the game. But that's a huge project that I was not set up to do, and I was like, okay, I think you guys can do this. And if you can't, you know, if you can't put this together, let me know. And of course, they're getting bought and buying people and doing all this crazy stuff that companies do. So I gave them like five years before, no, that's not right. They gave me like five years before they finally admitted they were never gonna do it and sent it back to me and now, okay, I can do this game as an entirely different kind of product, but I kind of have to redesign it from the ground up if I'm gonna do that. So that's why I let them sit on it for so long because I didn't know who else could publish it. Um, Lords of Vegas, do we know Lords of Vegas? This is a game with a lot of dice in it. and. Mike Seliker and I originally took that game to a specific publisher who was kind of in the forefront of charging too much for board games. I mean, everyone does it now, but <laughs> we thought, these guys might be the only company that can make this game, which was a terrible decision on our part because it gave them a lot of leverage over us. Um, and eventually they passed on it, but we were like, we have to sell it to them because we don't think anyone else is going to buy it. Now, luckily, Mayfair came along and did buy it, and they saw the, the value of it in and, uh, and they wound up publishing it with only four players worth of dice instead of six players, and they made the six player thing the expansion, and that's a way to make it cheaper, right? Um, but at the time, we were, if you make a game that only one publisher can make, and if they don't want it, if you make a Star Wars game and only one publisher has a Star Wars license in whatever subgenre of game you just made, then you have to file off the VIN or just not publish it. Yeah. How do you figure out which publishers can publish your game? Well, do, are we talking about licensing specifically, or, or, or uh, what, the reason? Just, I, the, the thing about Lords of Vegas general, was like, it was just so it, expensive. Is it more of the printing process, or the like license that you should? Well, both, about? right? So, it's, in terms of licensing, there are going to be individual companies who are the only one who can do a game about Firefly or whatever, right? Um, in terms of production, obviously, there's a, there's a lot more wiggle room there, but there are some companies, AEG right now is saying, well, sorry, AEG three years ago was saying, we specifically want games that are expensive to produce because we think that's our strong suit and we want games that people can't rip us off right, right away. Like if we make a successful game, 
we don't want someone else to come along and, and copy it. I don't know that that's right or wrong, but that's what they were saying. So, first of all, educate yourself a little bit about all the parts of the process. Understand how game production works. Um, if for any other reason, just because game companies will sell you lines of bullshit if you don't know what you're talking about, right? Understand what editing costs, understand what production costs, what retail, and all of the sort of steps of the process. It doesn't mean you have to do it or even do it well, but it ought to be something that you don't just ignore uh, because it'll be a weak point. It'll be a weak spot in your in your pitch. If you say, I, I don't know how you're going to make this game, but it has 5,000 cards and they're all different sizes, like, okay, uh, that's a bad <laughs> idea, right? Um, I think what you can determine from the retail shelf is pretty broad. You can tell what publishers are doing what, you know, how often and with what and at what price point and with what kinds of contents um, and with what kinds of themes. But you'll probably want to go deeper than that. You'll want to meet these companies uh, at their own booths, at, at shows, at the Gamma Trade Show, which is the industry show, or at Gen Con or Origins or one of the big or local gaming shows, wherever you can find their representation and, and talk to the people from the company directly. Because what a retail owner tells you is not going to be the truth about anybody. <laughs> I even had, I, I learned the following tidbit of knowledge from an employee at the Wizards of the Coast game store. Uh, back when Wansi had game stores, the retail staff volunteered the following information. Do you know why magic cards are so expensive? Because they can make it. That's a terrible expensive. lead, by the way. First of all, <laughs> if the main thing you sell is magic cards, don't ask a random customer, do you know why this is so expensive? But, okay, that's what he wanted to talk about. What he told me was that they have to be shipped to Belgium to be collated by hand. <laughs> Nothing about that makes any sense. <laughs> but sure enough, that's uh, apparently why magic cards are so expensive. What, wait, so so what I'm saying do? is that whatever rumors you hear from your local retail store about whatever a company wants or does or is in business or whatever are not trustworthy. What about prototypes? Don't they like require requests a lot of times of prototypes? Oh, absolutely. So then you send off your game, you have no game. How did you make, make another one? What's wrong with well, you, I man? A <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously though. So, so here's the thing: when you're actually pitching a game to a publisher, you probably can't be there. Hopefully, you can, but some of them don't even want you there. They want to see what the player's experience is going to be, and so you want to send them a game that is as good as you can make it, so that they don't have to screw around putting it together or figuring out what's missing or whatever. They want to open the box, play the game, and form an opinion, and they're going to do that in 20 minutes. Right, so yes, your prototype has to be amazing. You do not have to buy art for this prototype. Everyone understands that if you steal art that's in the same kind of category as the art you want, that's how your prototype's gonna look, right? You are technically violating copyright law when you do that, but everyone knows that's okay because you're not reselling that. You're saying, here's a picture of a dragon that I got off the cover of a book. This game is gonna have a picture of a dragon on it that you're gonna pay for, but we haven't got to that point yet. And in fact, if you do, invest too much in your prototype, it's a red flag because the publisher knows you're not going to want to change anything and that you're, you've, you've invested money in this thing that you want to recoup and they're still going to want to do their own art. Right? So, so make a prototype that's as playable as possible, clean lines, good typography. I actually have a 45 minute lecture online about graphic design for prototypes. Uh, specifically, yeah, go to Crab Fragment Labs okay. uh, and go to the, the lecture hall. You want, basically, you want to make it as easy as possible for them to play the game. And yeah, of course, you're going to surrender your prototype for all that time. You should be able to make another one. Um, I, I mean, even, even the most specialized parts in your game should probably be a thing that you can make more than once, I hope. Um, but uh, yeah, I, we have a lot of videos about prototypes, how to make cards, how to make boards, that sort of thing, mostly for playtesting, but that also works for prototypes. Look, a question I had is, you know, the games I've designed, I you know, Illustrator, Photoshop enough to yeah. steal some artwork and to do my own feathers and stick figures. But my assumption is, is they're going to hire their own artists. That is they, exactly right. And okay. in fact, it's you, usually it's the case it, that though, even your rule book, like yeah. even things you thought were done, yeah. they're going to redo. Sure. I just expect that. The publisher okay. is going to want to change some critical aspect of your game that you're not going to want them to change. Sure. You learn to live with that, right? Yeah. 
They're going to, or or else understand a good case why they shouldn't do it, right? right? And it can't just be ego. Right. That's that's the thing that a lot of publishers have to deal with with a lot of creators who have only made two or three things. Yeah. They're extremely invested in the thing they're trying to sell, and so yeah. they have ego in every piece of it. I try not to do that, of course, but there are times when, if you're going to make a game about about Las Vegas, don't take out the gambling parts. Like, <laughs> like, what are you going to, right? So. Understand the parts that are actually critical. Understand that you can let go of the rest. Um, who knows apples to apples, right? Yeah. The inventor of that game brought in this salad of game mechanics, like Cranium, more like Cranium, just a whole bunch of little things, and out of the box said, this little slice, this 10% of your game is the game. Throw away everything else. And that guy had to say, okay, for that game to, yeah. to be a success. And it was a good idea, and the publisher's not always wrong about that. But it's going to hurt like hell to throw away the other 90%, right? Yeah. yeah. So how do you know what the publisher is saying is truly best for the game? Is it best to, like, play test? To see how it <laughs> do you want their money? Yeah. <laughs> this, is the, this is the problem that creators are always going to have. It's quite likely that, the, what, that, their, that their choices are going to be wrong. But at some point, you're going to have to decide whether that compromise is worth getting paid, right? It's totally legit for you to come back and say, look, do not take the gambling out of my game. If you do, I have to not let you sell it, right? That's up to you. You sign that contract when you, are, when you agree with what's in it. But then you're, right, then you're back on the street trying to sell the damn thing, and at some point you want the money more than you want the, the you know, the, the, what's that word when, when people haven't torn your soul apart? Whatever that is. <laughs> if you still want that, you know, then maybe you have to say goodbye to the money. This happened... Um, uh, Mike Selinker and I uh, did a bunch of games together in the early noughties, and we we had a game that was kind of not quite done, and we didn't feel that way at the time, but the publisher came back and said, this is not quite done, it needs these changes. And he was half right, like it wasn't good, but the changes that he wanted to make weren't the right changes either, and it came out with those changes, and it wasn't that good. We should have been smart enough to take it back in-house and work on it for another six months, understanding the problems the publisher had, and find the right solutions to those problems and pitch it to them again. We should have done that. But, you know, there's six balls rolling at the same time. This guy wants to give us money. Let him change when he wants to change. The game comes about out. It's not very good. And theoretically, it turns to our reputation for that to happen. It doesn't. They never print it again. They never make a lot of money on it. And they don't want another game from us because that game didn't do well. So... Yeah, maybe they're wrong, and maybe it's right for you to say, in that case, you can't have it. Um, but maybe they're right, and I don't know that there's a litmus test for that. I think that sometimes you just roll the dice. Um, have you ever been to or know reputation for like the poker spiel um, conventions? I've never been to one. And I, I, I assume they're great, but I've never been to a Proto Spiel event specifically. I know that they uh, uh, they coexist with a lot of other cons that I go to, and sort of I sort of stroll in and out. But you probably know more about this than, than I do. Game Lab replaced Protospiel here, yeah, because Protospiel was only designers as playtesters for other designers, and you had to agree for your one-hour game to playtest for four hours to playtest your one-hour game, and so. There, and there, okay. in the best cases, some publishers were there looking, which is great. Mm -hmm. In some cases, there were very few publishers not really buying. So, uh, other than a good income of information... Mm -hmm. I, I would say, and this is off topic, but I would say, in terms of playtesting, it is valuable to have designers test your game, but it is also dangerous, and it is not the only kind of tester you should have unless you want to sell games to designers. Um, there's, two, there's two pitfalls. Obviously, designers are very smart. And they know what they're talking about. But two, the two big pitfalls are designers have their own games that they haven't made yet that they want to stick into yours, right? And, and maybe even try to take credit for it. So that's problem number one. But problem number two, though, is a more general case that they just see games differently than everyone else. And so the kind of feedback they're going to give you is the kind of feedback that's going to refine your product into a designers-only product. So yes, take it to Protospiel and get feedback. But no, don't just do that. Make sure that you're testing with gamers and even for and even non-gamers. Like yeah, I like to write games that are really at the bottom of the difficulty chart, and so I try to play them with non-gamers. I like to write casino games, right? Casino games are so simple that you can teach it to a drunk person in three seconds. <laughs> yeah. I'm not exaggerating. So that's not Settlers of Catan, not even close. 
You can't even teach someone to say Settlers of Catan in three seconds. Um, so when I was testing Tears, which is a very simple game, I made sure to take it not just to gaming cons, but like weddings and, and, and bars and just like ordinary non-gaming people who are kind of hard to get to play a game. If they could grok it, I knew I was good. And what, what game designers told me about that game was almost useless. Uh, so it really does depend on what kind of game you're trying to make and who it's eventually for. But I, 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 again, I've never been to one, so I can't really say much more. Three or four years ago, it used to be all about making the sell sheet that you can use to pitch to a publisher. Now, in the era of COVID and everything being distanced a lot, what has changed and what are some of the best practices to do a virtual pitch or to present things from distance? Well, I mean, a sell sheet is still the same thing, right? And I don't know, um, I don't know if there's been that much of a sea change, but I know that the video is easier than ever to make, and you shouldn't overlook that. Um, if you're going to pitch a game to a publisher now, it does make sense to have a sell sheet. A sell sheet is just a one-page explanation of your game, not as much in terms of how it works, but who it's for, how much it's going to cost, what the components are, who you think the market is, that sort of stuff. Um, and also how it is going to look, or how it should look. The video um, can do that work too, and we all have to become amateur video producers in this modern age. So um, uh, this is a question that's probably best answered by the company you're pitching to. You know, in what form and at what time do you want to get this pitch? And if they say, make me a 30 second video about what your game is, then that's what you got to do. Yeah, I'll usually three to five minutes. Yeah, the, I, I've been told one minute sizzle reel. Yeah. And, you know, it's like with most of my games, I can't explain all the mechanics in that much time. So I'm just like hitting the high points, the fun points. I, I write up a sell sheet, but the first thing they're going to look at is the video. And if they like that, then they'll read the sell sheet. And, you know, again, it, just iPhone or whatever and some rudimentary editing <laughs> software. I, uh, I used to make Kickstarter videos for myself and for the campaigns as well, and it really wasn't about explaining the entire product. Yeah. But Kickstarter video is about getting the investor to fall in love with you. And for $5, that's not so hard. You know, for 5000 it's a little, a little harder because yeah. you're pitching out to a game publisher, right? But the point isn't to teach them the whole game. Someone's not going to fall in love with your game after they learn the last rule. They're going to yeah. fall in love with it when they look at the cover. So that's what you're trying to show them in the sizzle reel, in the pitch video, in the sell sheet. What's the first thing that a customer is going to learn about this game that's going to make them to learn, make them decide to learn the second thing about it? That's kind of the way you have to think about it is, if I only had one second to get your attention, what would I tell you? If you gave me that attention for three more seconds, what would I tell you then? That's sort of the order that that information belongs in. And the mechanics of the rules of the game are pretty low down. Um, it's, it's a little easier when you are developing in a known style. You can say this is a worker placement game and now I know 90% of what I need to know. This is a deck builder. Now I know 95% of what I need to know. Um, but if you're trying to market a new kind of game or a game that's new to a particular audience, understand what the elevator pitch is, what the first thing they need to learn about it is and, and sort of arrange the information like that. Yeah. Can creating a bad game and like getting a bad re reputation cause a future like prototype of a new game, uh, like a bad reputation to even get it published or looked at? I don't. I don't think. Yes, but I don't think you need to worry about that. Um, I, I think this business is a lot about times at bat, and if you're swinging, you're you're doing the right thing, even if you're missing. Um, you can get a bad re reputation as someone who's hard to work with, as a bad individual. Right? That's, that's what you don't want. Don't, don't be a dick. But if you make a game that's not fun and nobody buys it, that's, that's completely forgotten the next time you show them a new prototype. Um, it is not forgotten when you try to sell them the same prototype again, though. Unfortunately, <laughs> I took a game to a publisher a couple years ago. They were like, yeah, it's not quite good. It has these problems. And I was like, you're right. I took it back to the lab. I fixed those problems. I took it back to them and like, we looked at this already. Yeah, but then thanks to your very useful feedback, I fixed the problems. Yeah, show us something else. So you can you, you sort of you know burn bridges one at a time, but I don't think it's going to hurt you. To, if your decision is, should I show this game? Because if it is bad, I will be permanently damaged. No, you should show the game. 
uh, you'll only be damaged if you do something wrong. But if the game is wrong, everyone understands. Sometimes games aren't good. Do another one, try again. I kind of wonder, for games that, like I was talking about before, the one Mike and I did where the publisher made kind of the wrong changes to make it better, you know, those reviews are always going to be out there. So if we do a new edition of that game, I don't actually know. I don't know if I have enough data to know if the bad reviews of the first edition are that poisonous to the value of the second edition. I don't know. Um, I think it might be just as wise if the game has changed enough to say, oh, this isn't that game. This is a whole new game with a different title. It is, it's in the same family, sure, but give it a chance. I don't know. Um, I don't know how long a bad review is going to dog you, and I don't, I don't know if anyone has an opinion on that. Uh, you might have trouble selling Glory Monday again. Oh, I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> I, I like playing your prototype, and then the published version was less good. But you're right. That. You're right. Well, the, you, I don't. I don't know if you played the prototype before or after the published version, but I, yeah, I've been retooling that game for a long time, and that is a good example of a game where I wonder if it has a reputation that it cannot undo. I just don't know. Yeah. Sadly, those reviews sit out there forever. They do. They do. So, but but I mean that that's part of the truth of the internet, right? But the other part is. Uh, it's possible to convince people that this edition is better. It just, it, it just, I don't know if, yeah. like, if starting from a blank slate is better or worse than starting from a known but not so good quantity. I think, I, you know. There, there are examples where it's game, second edition, and they're like, oh yeah, play the second edition. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I think, I mean, D&D &D survives on editions, right? Like, like everyone has the never-ending struggle about which edition is better. Publish a new edition just to make the extra money. Ah, uh, yes. Go ahead. So we've, we've got a lot of answers to how do I do this thing, how do I do that. What are some red flags that you might have that make you stop and say, this isn't ready for a pitch? As a publisher, I never took submissions. Um, that wasn't the structure of what I was doing. I don't know that I have an easy list of red flags, but um, off the top of my head, the first one is something I mentioned before, which is that if the artist seems too invested in it, either financially or emotionally, so that the publisher can't do what they perceive as their job, which is peeing on a little and making it more like their own. Um, it just indicates that it's going to be a difficult relationship. And if I have my choice, of three games I love, and two of them came from people I know I can work with, and the other one comes from a stranger who's kind of a pain in the ass, That's a, that's a that, that one's going to get cut, right? The game has to be exceptional, and I don't know that. The thing is, nobody knows. Now, I talk to Ryan Dancy about this all the time at, uh, at uh, AEG. He fully admits that as a publisher, he could have looked at 15 of the last 20 breakout success games and rejected them because he didn't understand what he was looking at. And people are like that. You know, the problem with selling through a publisher is that the publisher is one more gatekeeper, and so are the distributors, and so is the retail store, and so are the first players who play your game. Everyone along that channel has to be satisfied with what they see, or else that's the end of the road for that product. And some of the gatekeepers, especially when your product is new, don't know what they're looking at, they won't know it's any good. Magic the Gathering had real trouble doing any pre-sales until it actually hit the public, because the intermediaries thought it was a waste of time, right? They couldn't sell to a retail store, but as soon as people couldn't stop buying it, the retail stores woke up and said, ah, I know what money is, and they started buying it, right? But, but no, a lot of people could look at the description of that product on paper in 1993 and say, there's nothing here. This is baseball cards, and I have to learn a game, right? Or whatever their reasons were, Everyone rationalizes what they think, but they didn't see the potential in it. That's the way a lot of new products are going to be. So, you know, this is a struggle that, that, that you're going to have. When you have what you think is a new idea, um, and a great idea, someone has to recognize that or take a, ch a chance on it. This is why I've liked self-publishing. It's not just um, that it's easier or that it makes less money. but that I can take chances that gatekeepers would not let me take. 
Have there been any examples of like a Kickstarter game that gets, you know, gets the game to market and then the guy says, hey, I'm going to now try to sell this to a bigger company for bigger distribution than my Kickstarter can get? How did Cards Against Humanity get started? Was it a Kickstarter? It was it was yeah. some free distribution print it yourself okay. kind of card game mm -hmm. that for its initial period, retail stores weren't even allowed to buy. Yeah. It was huh. through Amazon that uh, Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition was kickstarted. And then after the Kickstarter was completed, but before it was um, anyone got a copy, they also next signed a contract with Target to sell copies of the game. And Target got their copies first. Yeah. That happens. Um, I think there are some instances where a Kickstarter project finds itself in trouble before it ships, and a, a white knight publisher sort of strides in to save it. Um, it's different every time. But, uh, I guess but, yeah, I'm asking, like, if, if I self-publish a game just to kind of get some momentum behind it, would I, and then want to sell it to another company, are they yeah. going to say, well, it's already on the Yeah, market, this is uh, another double-edged sword, right? Yeah. Like, the, the, there's no clear answer, and it, a lot of it has to do with the opinions of the publisher. Right. Like, uh, I got a friend who runs a game company, and I show him games from time to time, yeah to play games with him. Yeah. And every time it turns into a pitch meeting, and I'm not trying, but he's like, I know how, I could probably make this one of my branded games. I'm like, I wasn't trying, but okay, let's talk about that. <laughs> and then later in the same conversation, he says, but wait, have you shown this to the public yet? Yeah. Yes, it's on it's on Crab Fragment Labs, yeah. which is about as effective as writing it chalk on the sidewalk. Yeah. But yes, technically the public can see this. And he's like, well, maybe it's, maybe it's already run its course now. So, it really comes down to the opinions of the publisher, but man, a game that's successful, of course you want that. Yeah. I mean, if you were, if you could pick up Settlers of Catan right now and start printing and selling it, wouldn't you? Yeah. And it's already been sold to a lot of people, yeah. sometimes more than once. Like, <laughs> there's, there's no good argument against a successful game continuing yeah. to be successful. What they're trying to say is that everyone who's gonna want this game has already seen it, but that's pretty hard to prove. There are some companies like uh, Deepwater Games, they kind of specialize in this, where they will mm -hmm. find medium to well-funded Kickstarters and then make a, an agreement with them in publishing. They did games like uh, Gladius and Fantastic Factories mm -hmm. that were good Kickstarters that were self-published, yeah. and then they went and made an agreement and went into a much larger distribution deal after the fact. Okay. Yeah, because Kickstarter reaches a specific but different audience than yeah. hobby market sales. Sure. Right, that that business model sounds pretty strong. To so yeah. say, look, this thing did well enough at Kickstarter yeah. that it could probably do well enough in the main retail channel. Yeah. But obviously, the guy who ran the Kickstarter probably doesn't have the distribution like connections yeah. to make that happen. Yeah. So yeah, I think you should hope that that happens. Okay. Yeah. We talk about self-publishing again, where if I don't have this, the reason I don't self-publish games is because I don't have all those skills of distribution, marketing, and all. all that. Yeah. And, but with that print and play model, what are those skills you need to just kind of pare that down with the, kind of the basics for a self publisher with your cheap app model? The, um, the skill set of a self published game maker is pretty broad. Yeah. Um, I think the most important one, and the one that I don't have, is social outreach. I don't really do social media very well. Like, it is a half hour of, of sweat. To, to write a tweet for me because I just because I, I don't I don't read Twitter I don't care about Twitter I don't I, I think lowly of the people who use it and so I can't see myself ever being very successful at social media that's been some person that I've always had to hire to help me promote what I'm doing in any venue that isn't print ads because that's where I learned to do it you know 30 years ago you would buy ads in the magazines what's in the what's right yeah. um, so you have to be able to tell people what the hell you're doing. I can't even use BGG. Like, that place is a mystery to me, and so my games don't even have pages there. And so what am I doing, right? But along with that, you do need to be able to produce, to design, to do graphic design of a product to a level that people don't, like, start itching when they try to play it. So graphic design, layout, 
um, art sourcing of some kind, either knowing how to use clip art properly or knowing how to draw or having a, 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 a confederate, what are they called when they actually help you? I don't know what those words are, but having someone who can do art for you at a reasonable price, um, writing, editing, game design, uh, all of those bits. What about web, web design? I'm no good at web design, and it's and my website is fine. Like these right. days, the tools for that are super, super available. Now, yeah. it's a graphic design challenge, and so that's that's something I have covered. Luckily, that hasn't changed too much. But the tools for web design, my my website's built in, in Square now, in Squarespace, um, and they optimize for mobile, and they do it all for you, and they have all these templates to just do the work. So yeah, I, luckily web design is not as as important as it used to be. Yeah. Um, you started this by suggesting that your best option, if you're not focused on the money, is make your game and give them away. Right? Yeah. Uh, talk more about that. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, so so my, my pitch about that is this. As consumers of retail products, retail entertainment products in general, we tend to get in our mind the AAA blockbuster picture of what a product is what a movie is, what a book is, what a game is, because we go to the store and we see the stuff that's had a bunch of money poured into it. Individuals can't make that. I can't make Pokemon tomorrow because I can't make a TV show and movies and trading card games and everything that goes with that. No individual can do that, but we don't have to. That's not the only kind of entertainment there is. There are short stories, there are poems, there are blog posts, there are uh, all kinds of categories of entertainment, those examples are all writing, but that are still entertaining, but they're not products. Um, like I said, the reason that I don't make a lot of, or didn't make a lot of abstract games was that as a publisher, I didn't know how to sell it. Even as a designer selling to other publishers, I didn't know how to sell it. I just know how to make them. So I gave them away for free. There's a whole bunch of abstract games that cheap ass games just gave away or used as ads or whatever, however I could leverage them the best that I could. But I knew I couldn't print them and sell them for more than I paid for them because nobody wants to buy them. That category of game is fine to give away. Games that are played with a standard poker deck or extremely generic components are fine to give away. And when you make these games and when you get feedback from your players, not just about your prototypes, but about what you're calling done. You will learn a lot, they will have fun, and you'll be well equipped to make the next one. And this is why I say don't just try to make a AAA blockbuster title as your first project, because there's all these great sort of milestones or, or stepping stones of simpler projects that will teach you a lot and not cost you a lot of money or time to, uh, to get them done. Yeah. In that scenario, do you see yourself more as you yourself being the product instead of the games that you were developing? If so I was marketing a company, I would say yes. Um, Cheap Ass Games was built around myself as a designer and myself as a product and the brand as the product as, as opposed to the individual games. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily true now, but certainly like what I'm doing now is meant to be a destination where people can like learn about games and try the new thing and whatever. So yeah, I think so. I think you have to this is part of the marketing and the social media thing, but you have to realize that people want a nexus, a single thing that they can like that can then turn into all these other little things. If each game that I made tried to find an audience through a different channel, that would be even more complicated and difficult. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Would you say when making these like games that there's a specific bad theme or themes that you shouldn't use, or do you think any theme's like, fine? That's a pretty open question, but... Um, yeah, theme as, a, as an aspect of game design is a topic in and of itself. But part of what I'm saying about abstracts is they don't have what I think you're referring to as a theme. They do still have a, a, a flavor, if you will. I mean, like I like writing abstract games that are part of a fiction story or they have something about them, but it isn't like this is Star Wars and you're Luke Skywalker and the enemy is Darth Vader. Like none of that, right? It's just pieces on a board. Um, aside from doing things that you would never do in fiction, like I don't think there are good and bad starting points. Um, 
you need to ask your audience. You need to understand your audience and figure out what kind of games they want to see. And so I, I can't answer that specifically, I think, for anyone. We have just a few minutes left. Any other personal questions, or what have I completely forgotten to talk about? I'm glad we didn't wait for the other panelists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any experience or advice on like trying to research um, what the market wants? <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, people who get paid way more than me can't figure that out. Um, and again, and I, I, Ryan, Ryan Dancy is another good example, right? He poured a lot of money into understanding what, for instance, D and D players wanted before the OGL, the Open Gaming License, uh, the D twenty games. He did huge surveys and learned almost nothing. You know, retail stores didn't know what they were doing. Players didn't know. No one can tell you what they want. You can see what they do, but you can't ask them what they want. They just don't know how to tell you. Um, and so the best new ideas sound like bad ideas until suddenly they become obvious, right? Uh, I don't think there is a good answer to that. I think you can get some practical things like how much are people willing to pay, right? Well, <laughs> look at the price tags at, at the retail store. That'll tell you what people are willing to pay. Um, but what do they want next? That's your challenge there's no there's no trick to that you got to figure that out I, I when I wrote brawl I, uh, I walked around Dragon Con mm -hmm. looking for what wasn't there that's not an easy thing to do yeah. but that was my goal right and I came up with the idea for a real-time fighting game that was like structured like a video game you know mm -hmm. 30 seconds of playing cards yeah. and then see who wins right and it, with with action cartoons and whatever that's that's what that's what I made that day when okay. I said I want to make whatever isn't here. All right. um, but that, yeah, that's the, the ultimate challenge of product design is figuring out what mm -hmm. what people are going to want that they don't already know they want. What is the best view at looking at like feedback from play testers? Like, how should you be looking at the feedback? Another entire panel. Um, <laughs> similarly, players can't always tell you what they want. Yeah. Um, and so you're going to get some weirdly colored feedback from any play tester because you've elevated them to the position of telling you what to do. And they aren't necessarily comfortable with that. If they're not having fun, that's completely right. If they tell you what's wrong or how to fix it, that's probably not right. So appreciate and welcome everything they tell you. I, I had a play tester once tell me my cards were too thick. <laughs> I'm like, whatever, I can't control that, but fine. That's great, what else do you have for me? Like, take the love and not the advice because they might then say something useful. But if you shut them down, they're, they're, they're going to stop talking, right? Um, I, this is said about writing and said about everything, but, but when, when someone tells you that they didn't like it, they're right. When they tell you how to fix it, they're wrong. You have to watch them, see what they're doing, see where their actual stumbling points are, and then take it back to the drawing board and actually fix those problems and go to the next test with that problem in mind and see if you fixed it. Uh, but yeah, that's the best I can do on that answer in, in one minute. Uh, anything else? What time do we have? We do have a couple more minutes left. If a, if a publisher has a tile-laying game, are they likely to have another tile-laying game? Is it not worth pitching? It's worth asking. Yeah. The thing asking is free. Yeah. You don't even have to show them the product to ask them if they want another one, right? Maybe they have a die that they're desperate to reuse. Maybe they want to make tile-laying, right? right. Um, my, I have a publisher now who wants, because they publish TAC, they want to be the publisher that does all the abstract games from all the fiction. Okay, great, let's do that again, right? But I don't know that until I ask them. They might be like, we did that once, we don't want to do it again, let someone else take that risk. Or they could be, well, we want to be known for that. We want six more of those. Um, it is entirely unknowable, right. just ask. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Thank you all for coming, everyone. And please visit craftfragmentlabs.com. Everything is print and play. Play it for free. Uh, let us know what you think. Everything's happening. <laughs> this weekend only. And what are you working on that you are most excited about? Um, I have to say the most exciting product that I have right now is called Vines, and it is a trick-taking game, or rather, is a suite of trick-taking games that was developed before the pandemic. Like, it's really hard to do a lot of playtesting right now. 
And so I happened to have this game in the pocket because I wrote it for a publisher who asked for it, changed their mind, here it is. It's like 20 or so trick-taking games with a five-suited deck. They're just clever. They're just super fun. And I have it with me. I'll happy to happily play it with everyone uh, here. I want to keep making new games for this deck. Um, this deck is the one that I was talking about doing the short story about uh, as well, the solitaire uh, gambling game. So yeah, I'll, I'll show you that uh, later on in the weekend. Cool. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>